Okay, thank you all for coming. So my name is Christoph. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm the author of the Boost Metastate Machine Library. Uh, for those who don't know, is the stuff which kills your compiler and forces you to upgrade compiler, uh, CPU, and RAM. So I'm w probably working for Intel somehow. Well, um, joke aside, um, also at the same time writing this new library. And to as paid work, I'm managing uh, the software department of, at uh, Dr. Schenk, as you can see it. So we're making inspection systems. So we're a small software department of about 20 people. And everybody's forced to use this stuff even so if they don't, even if they don't want. So no choice. Um, I have a small problem. I have a slight tendency to switch back to German without noticing. If it happens, please tell me, OK? It happens sometimes. So, um, who was here at my talk last year? Oh, not so many. Okay, so I can repeat my story of last year then, because I love it, and it was supposed to be so popular also. Maybe not so fast. Okay. Good. So this is my favorite story. You know, you will never go to a, to a fast food restaurant again without thinking about it. I promise you, everybody told me the same. So, we have a fast food restaurant. See, it's a very simple one. I, I hid the name. Of the, of the company, you know. And so there's a single worker. We have one queues for where burgers land when they're ready. And we have also a single machine to make drinks. And well, this machine has no queue, can be just do just one drink. There's also some, some, somewhere here to place to make fries. So I wouldn't make any advertisement to any restaurant, of course. So then comes the first customer. Well, where the worker asked, what is your order? What, can, what do you want? And this is what the first guy is thinking, and everybody is waiting. So there are more and more customers. What to do? Well, the typical answer is, let's hire a second employee. It will be double as fast. So we hire a second employee. Now we have two cash desks, and the owner is a bit, you know, he dreams, dreams a bit. Now we are going to reduce waiting times. Will this scale? Well, it turns out, no. It turns out that this is, the cost is coming. I mean, if you've ever been to, to some kind of this fast food restaurant, you probably saw it. So, so both employees can fight to get the same burger here. So both want to serve, to serve the customer first. And I'm always the guy who is losing each time. He's losing three times in a row, and I'm, waiting, I'm the longest waiting customer in the restaurant. That's why I don't go to the kind of restaurants anymore. I'm happy that my kids don't want to do it again. And so I always lose. And sometimes it gets even worse. They get in, in each other's way. So one got fry, a drink and needs fries. Someone has fries and needs a drink. And it's, there's not much place to go behind the desk, you know. And they're pushing each other and they manage to go through. Sometimes something falls to the floor and they have to restart everything. And during this time, everybody is still waiting here. Hmm. I mean, nobody sees this stuff, so okay. Um, during this time, everybody is waiting, and the queue grows and grows until some people give up. Um, at the same time, the cost explodes because you have double more employees and you don't even serve more, um, more customers. The customers flee the restaurant in panic, and, well, the restaurant is bankrupt. It's a tragic story. I mean, if I like this kind of fast food restaurants, it will be really a tragedy, right? Can we avoid this? Well, we're going to change everything. We're going to say we have just one worker, but he's a really good worker, and he's, 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 he's damn good. He's every month the employee of the month. And the worker runs really, really, really fast. He runs from the cash desk to the second cash desk to the drinks machine to the burger queue. And he's doing is this. You will not believe it in zero time. It's good. It's really good. And, well, to manage this in zero time, he never, ever waits. He, instead, he's not just fast. He's, he has a very good memory also. And he remembers in which state of the order the customer is. So he goes to the first customer and says, what is your order? I'll be back when you think. He goes to the next one. What is your order? I'll be back. Did you find? Yes, you want a drink. OK. Hop goes back. So now, what burger do you want? This one? Okay, I go take it. And then it goes to the next one, and it runs very fast in all directions. Each time something new happens, so a burger gets ready, a customer knows what he wants, uh, a drink is ready, everything, and 
At this time, it comes and handles this new event. It only reacts to events. It can wait, but never blocks. So here you see our worker in action, running from customer to customer. Every customer is in, this, in, a, in a given state. This one, all the Big Mac, and is thinking what he wants for drink or for fries. This one, anyway, is just waiting. And this one, he was a drink, and he, and he wants to have it. It's the last step, and then he needs to pay. And he runs, and for every customer, follows the same algorithm. Of course, this is a great worker. Not only is fast, he has a great memory, and he has a perfectly tuned algorithm. It's good. And all this is just one. So we save cost and we're faster. This brings us to our pattern of the day. No questions so far? My small story? OK. So we have a manager implemented, like our worker, as a state machine. Because for those who don't know me, um, I like state machines. And this manager, so this worker, is non-work, non-blocking. It just runs. And all what is computing, so the hardware, the long-running algorithms, they are controlled asynchronously, and they live somewhere else, in other threads, threads, in other machines. We just don't know. To achieve this, we need, we need first of all, a state machine library. So in my last talk last year, well, I showed a state machine library. There are several ones. I can just advise you boost MSM, meta state machine. No, it's, 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 it's quite OK. It's working. Um, well, but I'm not making any advertisement. You know, it's not my style. And you need also some infrastructure to manage all this asynchronous behavior. So last year I showed you this, now I'm going to show the second part. So there is boost asynchronous. I mean, it's not boost yet. I want to offer to review this uh, next year. And um, there are also other infrastructure, of course, which I'm going to show. My favorite one, who was in the talk of, of executors yesterday? Oh, a few ones. You liked it? No? OK. <laughs> if it makes you feel better, Neither did I. So here's the example which you find everywhere. We have a call to STD async with some lambda, which returns, of course, to 42. It has to be 42. It just has to be. And you get a future, from a, a future int, which means uh, this stuff is good to run. And when it's done, my future will be set or have an exception. And by calling get, I wait for result and I block until it's ready. Sounds pretty simple. Unfortunately, well, blocking is bad because me, I write state machines and a run to completion says I have to run in zero time. And blocking is clearly more than zero. This is bad. The second stuff, if I block, uh, I can say goodbye to all my, my heart or even my, not my weak real time requirements. They are just gone. I have no way to, to manage them. When I block, I'm not going to talk to anybody believe it or not, and so, well, nobody's going to know what I'm doing. There will be no diagnostics. And if I block, your problem is going to be less responsive. Everybody probably got some user interface when you press a button and you wait, and you see the cursor, busy cursor, and you click on it, it becomes white, and, and that's gone, and you wait and wait, and think, this stuff is probably dead, let's kill it. It doesn't even want to go, oh man, it's terrible. <laughs> so, this is the stuff which I hate. Um, typical cute, cute, uh, cute stuff, right? No, OK, OK, is that someone doing it well? Of course. And now the bonus question, in which thread is this lambda executed? Yes, you don't know. So actually, you think you're asynchronous, and maybe you're not. Maybe you are, but maybe you're not. Hmm. So maybe that, I don't like this too much. Um, well, if we continue this, I think, what do we have for alternative? We can block while waiting, what we just saw. OK. We can pull. Are you ready? No, I come back later. Are you ready? No, I come back. Are you, yes, OK, great. Now I can call get. Great. Well, it's the first two choices I don't like. Do I have a third one? Yes, I have a third one. I can put all these futures, we can go to do many asynchronous stuff, in a big bag of futures, close it, carry them right back, and from time to time, do one of the both, either pull or block. Hmm. I don't know, but you know, polling is so much in the 80s, I don't like it too much. <laughs> I did it when I was a student, but I, and I'm not proud of it. Honestly, not. So for those who went to the talk yesterday, they just already saw this one. When you do something like this, you think, I thought, first time I saw, oh, great. I make two tasks uh, asynchronous, and well, at some point, they'll be executed. But to be honest, I don't care of the result. I just want them to be executed. 
Es ist was nicht plant. Das war fast ein You have to react fast. You know, when you don't block, you're very fast. So you think these two steps are going to be done asynchronously. Well, they are not. The second line will not complete until F does. This stuff here. Because, I can't believe it myself when I saw it. Oh, I forgot to write it. Okay. Because this is going to give you a feature back as a result. And if you ignore it, it will block in the destructor. So you just, for a very expensive price, called F and G, which you would have done sequentially. Nice. Well, people in the start committee thought, yes, it's, how did they say yesterday? Uh, it was a disaster, right? The disaster of async. OK. So we're going to make it better. We're going to add them. So OK. I could make the first asynchronous function. It's going to return this time, not 42. I don't know why. OK, and um, I'll get to get a future. And then I'm going to say, when, I don't want to wait for it, but when the first task will be done, call me this stuff, the next lambda, with the future, which actually is going to be the same as this one. And this call here will not block, because when I'm called, it means uh, my future is set. Oh, great. So now I don't block, right? Never. Hmm. And here? Well, now I don't block on the first asynchronous task. I'm going to block on the last asynchronous task, which is going to be hard because I will not know how long it's going to last. To last. And during this time, I will have the same problem. I will block, I will pull, or I will carry my bag of futures. OK, maybe it's time to be bag of just one, or maybe a few, a few less, but I will still block. Hmm. Great? No. Huh? And the executor part is even more fun. I, 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 had, I had a good time yesterday. So we have something a bit more asynchronous already, which is boost ASIO. And for example, if I want to write asynchronously, I make async write on this socket, send this request, and when you're done, call this stuff back. So it has this signature. OK. Now, now it's really asynchronous. Unfortunately, it still has a few disadvantages. The first one will be the object lifetime. Because you know, when they do TCP communication, it can take very long. And it can be that the one who gives the order. So in this case, this is no more here when the callback comes. Um, I had my first share of, tra of crashes on this one. I thought, this time, this time I got it right. It cannot happen. It can. So this is the first one. To manage it, it's very, it's very hard because um, you have no, no, you have just one single thread which you run, and you have not much help, and well, you have no thread pool, nothing, and well, besides network communication, it's a bit limited. For network communication, it's great, but for more, it's a bit too limited. I'm going to show what I mean with managing asynchrony. I don't have all the tools which I would like to have. What I would like would be something like this. I have several post callback. I pose this task to a scheduler, which I will define. And I'm going to get a callback when it's done. I have an expected, which is type which I define as synchronous, which means says, uh, like a future, you have a value or you have an exception. But anyway, it's not blocking. So when the callback comes, it's done. And it has to be thread safe. I want it thread safe, of course. I want it to forward exceptions. I want it to be non-blocking. And I want it to take lifetime considerations. Object, object limitation, lifetime to coffee consideration. I don't want it to be called if the one who gave the order is gone. Would be great? Mm -hmm. Not yet, we'll see. Uh, the first stuff I hear when I start talking about this is, wait, I can do so much simpler with some mutex. Ah, I love this. Well, let's have a structure. I call it unsafe so that you know it's not going to, be, to finish good, the story. And it has a... It has a mutex. Well, it's a boost mutex, but it will not make it better, I promise. And well, I have a public member and a private member. The private member will not take any mutex. And the public one will lock, call the private part, and unlock. Hmm. This is called, some name, thread safe interface. 
So nothing bad can happen from something like this. Is it safe? What can go wrong? Hmm? Exceptions, yes. Okay, okay. Plan B, I remove this, I guard. So, no, I'm threat safe. Well, um, let's say this stuff is called on a signal, well, normal signal, it's a boot signal, and which doesn't take the left hand consideration, so which goes on pointer, something like this. And at the same time, because I don't know exactly which thread this stuff is leaving, at the same time, the one who holds this stuff alive is going to destroy it. So the destructor will run, destroy the mutex at the exact point where someone is going to be here. So, you're gone. Well, now you can say, of course, I will forbid every signal. Okay, great. Hmm, there's not much left, but well. And then I'm, I'm going to be sure there will never be any pointer to anything, because no, anyway, it's bad, this is true. And well, and of course, of course, I'm never going to forget a single lock. I'm going to check my code perfectly. Well, the experience turns in my unfortunate long experience of debugging code of others very long and very painful, I promise you. Um, usage of mutex, you will not believe it, but it's true, you lead to races, which is one of my favorite sentences after um, a template today keeps Java away. I love it. I have another one. Where there is a mutex, there is a race. Sorry, Atmut, I already took it. You cannot have it anymore. I mean, I can lead it for you for, the, for your talk, of course. Um, why? Because when the code becomes big, not like in a very simple ex uh, example, I'm going to forget it. I'm going to have a big lock, first of all, and then I'm going to say, oh, it's too big, so I'm going to unlock in between and to retake the lock after, and then I'm going to forget something, and someone else will, will change my code, and it will not work anymore. So where there's a mutex, there is very often, very often a race, and when I see a, uh, when I see a backtrace come or a core file come on my desk, I look, okay, where is it? Let's look for the mutex. Mm -hmm. Ha! Okay, now let's look for the rest. Here, okay, done. Well, it takes a few more hours, but it's a, it's a principle. And worse is when there's a deadlock. So deadlocks, when you have mutex, you have deadlocks. I mean, when you have, where there are two mutexes, there is a deadlock. Not always, but pretty often. And if you have three, four, or five, then it becomes fun. So then you have the choice between when you have your 20 members, one mutex protecting everything, but then, you know, it's not granular enough to be too slow. You can have to have 20 mutexes, which you have to take in the exact same order. So what's your lost? Hmm. Hmm. It's not going to finish good. And it, it, it really doesn't. If you use more STD or boot thread, which are great class, but you should not use by yourself, uh, this leads to usually safe join because it's pretty hard to know who is going to be the last one uh, stopping this stuff. Or as a boost, you, uh, reading the boost user mailing list will show you from version 52, 53, I forgot. Um, they said to, uh, to do exactly like in the STD thread, which means that if you destroy the thread object before the run method is done, uh, then you get an exception, which means usually a crash because nobody caches stuff. And well, hmm. there are many, many, many mails on the boost mailing list. People say, I don't get, I installed a new boost version and now it crashes all the time. It's probably boost. And, well, when this happens, so you try to shut down, and by shutting down, well, you get to try to close your thread object, which you usually keep alive all, your, all the time, but well, and this time, no. And then it will crash because of this, and the crash that shut down usually lead to your tools, Valgrind, Elgrind, Sanitizer, being really unhappy. Hey, you have got memory leaks. No, I'm not memory leaks. I just had a small problem at shutting down. Yes, but to the tool, it looks the same, and then you think, oh, it's okay, I probably have no, mem no, no, I have no memory loss. And, well, you do. And it means also that files, DB connections sometimes, and TCP connections are not closed properly, and which leads to some funny fun bugs which I got, uh, crash at shutting down. And this point happens, we restart immediately the, the application. So it restarts, tries to get the port on server, and so server port to accept, Get an exception because it's in use because I didn't close properly. Then I crash again. I restart. 
And then I crash again. It goes, let's say, about 30 seconds. And then at some point, so Linux say, okay, I'm going to close this stuff. And then I can start. Um, the bug reports from the customers are, well, fun. And for the, uh, a small explanation, uh, we, are be, we are building at Dr. Shanks, so, so optical inspection system. So we have some materials or a piece of glass or smartphone or whatever, and we inspect it with cameras. And when the, in the factory, so the glasses are coming very fast, at, uh, so thousands and thousands every day. And if we block or if we have a crash, usually it happens following. Uh, if we are lucky, the full line stops. The client doesn't manage to the customer doesn't manage to produce anything anymore. He's not happy. Even worse, um, the, the machines before, they don't like it. And um, all the glasses which are staying on the queue are destroyed. And the machine is dirty, so we have to make unplanned maintenance, empty the wall line, clean everything, and restart. At this time, or shortly before, uh, it goes as a customer from the worker to, this to his boss, to his boss, to his boss. Then at some point, it jumps to the boss, my boss boss, then to my boss, then to me, and then I have a bad day. <laughs> so I try to avoid this at all costs. And this is when I'm lucky. When I'm not lucky, um, no, no, nothing stops the line, and you have a robot at the end who takes the glass and says, bad, I throw it, good, I keep it. It makes throw, 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 three hours long, and then I have a really bad day. Now, now it's really a bad day. So I, I started looking for patterns to agree to help me. So the safe pattern falls, okay. As it's a bit too complicated for this. Um, well, we have active objects. It's quite old pattern. I don't know if you still know it. I don't know if someone's still teaching these days. It goes this way. Um, you have a servant, which is here, which is a threat unsafe class. It's really unsafe. It has no mutex, luckily, and uh, it cannot do a concurrency at all. And people are not going to see it. People are going to see so, the author do a proxy, which is going to behave almost like the servant, but except of returning void and int, it, when it's done, it will return future void and future int, which means at some point it will be done, and you will have the result. And okay, and when um, when the, someone wants to get it, it calls a, some method, the same member of the proxy, which is going to pack it in a nice functor, put it in an activation queue. On the other side of the queue, there will be a scheduler, so a thread. We should get to take it from the queue, execute the job, which means forward the call to this one. The, way the surfing will be done, and the future will be set. Okay, it's pretty simple. Um, it makes your thread unsafe part, thread safe by serializing calls. The outside world is a proxy. Unfortunately, they are very expensive because you will have one thread for every active object. Every object is going to be expensive. And you still didn't paralyze, so you just mess something thread safe. It's not going to be fast. Well, now let's go to the library itself. So this is not going, it's not boost yet, but it's still in the boost name space. I want to, uh, I said one year ago, I want to have a review in 2014. I'm probably not going to manage anymore. So let's say 2015 this time. But this time we're really going to make it in 2015. Uh, C plus 11 only. I can already see the discussions. No, it has to be C plus plus 03. Uh, no, honestly, um, let's say it honestly. I have two, I do this on my free time. I don't intend to spend my nights, nights helping some, Company making crappy compilers, <coughs> Microsoft. <coughs> um, um, I'm not going to help them uh, by writing uh, weeks and weeks of work to make it 0 3 so that they can delay implementing C11. No, I'm not going to do it. Sorry. It works and compiles with GCC from 47 and Clang from 34. It may be even 33. It's head only, but you will have to link to boost thread and depending on what you use for features, chrono the time serialization. So the, the principle of asynchronous is to make you think in task and not thread. So we forget the word thread, okay? We're going to give it a new meaning soon. Uh, for the moment, let's forget thread. There is no thread. Uh, it helps you prevent these races, deadlocks and crashes. Not all the crashes, but quite some of them. The tasks are, are, are executed asynchronously. And the result of task can be isn't as a future, but it's not what you want. Usually, you want a callback. And it's not blocking. No. 
We changed a bit the principle, so we had an active object, which was one servant in the full thread world. Now we're going to change it to a new name, which I, which I just made up just now, an active world, which means there will be several or many, many, many objects in this, living in this one thread. And we have, therefore, a defined world where the objects are going to live. I know my object is living in this scheduler world and nowhere else. Ah, great. We separate schedulers from queues, which is not what the standard was doing, was saying to, to do yesterday. I was a bit disappointed to mix all, all together in one executor and that's it. No, we have scheduler and we have queues. And by switching the queues, you get different behavior. If you have a queue, you have, you have FIFO. If you use a stack, you're going to have a, st a use the stack. So last in first out behavior and that's it. The shutdown is defined. It's not going to be the normal sh shutdown when you have threads and mutex, which will be like this. No, it's not going to be like this. And the objects in the active words, they are our restaurant workers. As of course, never block and never, and never blockingly wait. And for all what they need, they are helped by thread pools or some special schedulers. So far, so good? No question? Okay, all dead? No? Okay, not yet, good. So we have, yesterday in the talk, I was also di disappointed to see the only job type which the standard committee was considering was a function void. And that's what I was thinking, well, no, this is a bit just, I see a few more kind of jobs. So let's say, in this case, you have a callable concept, which is type erasure, because of course I love type erasure, and I like to build on it, which is really callable void. This is a basic job, okay, it's just something callable. You call it and it's done. And you have different jobs, for example, logable, it's callable, plus it gives you a name, a posted time, a finished time, and a failed. Posted time is the time where the job is put in the queue, and finished time is the time where it's finished from the queue. There's a few more, there's also the time where it's taken from the queue, so you know exactly how long it waited and how long it took, and if it failed. You have a serializable concept, which is callable plus save and load, so you can use it remotely. And you have a logable and serializable, which is so Concepts. It's very simple with type erasure. I can just use the library. So logable and serializable. So unfortunately, now I have to make you uh, eat a big number of new terms. Otherwise, you will not know what I'm talking about in the next slides, which would be sad. Uh, a scheduler is something having zero to n threads. So we say we change the thing with threads. It's a processing unit. So you never see them. And this scheduler is executing a job or callbacks. And when it's finished, this scheduler, because you to see, it is a weak pointer to a scheduler. It doesn't keep the scheduler alive, but it has a way to talk to it and to be able to send it new jobs. A servant is our manager, our object living in a single thread scheduler. It starts out. Job for a scheduler to execute. And we have a servant proxy, which is like the active object, so a thread safe object, looking like a servant, feeling like a servant, but it's not, and it's serializing call to the servant. We have a scheduler shared proxy. It's something holding the scheduler from outside and interfacing with it. And the last instance of the proxies of the scheduler will join the, 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 the thread of the scheduler, and when it's destroyed, your thread is, is stopped, finished, and joined. Clean. You're done. We have a concept of proxy scheduling, so it can be between threads of the same scheduler or between schedulers. And when I talk about posting, it's enqueuing some, something, a job, in a scheduler's queue. Okay? So let's say seven, seven proxy, scheduler, scheduler proxy. This is inside, this is outside. The servants are visible outside. The last one leading, the last scheduler leading, the, 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 the last servant leading the thread. The scheduler will, will stop the thread, and the last proxy will join. Which is this? I don't know if you see that from well from far, so we explain you. Mm -hmm. 
he is our single strip. We have two servants, one and two. We have our scheduler and a weak scheduler. And the only stuff which the servant knows is a weak scheduler, so don't keep it alive. And we have proxies outside. So these proxies keep the servants alive. And they also keep the scheduler proxy alive. So now I have my two objects outside and two inside. I have a thread pool for all the stuff which I need to run concurrently of my island. And they are, this stuff is kept alive for the same time. Now, when I want to stop something, let's say I start destroying Castle Point 7. So the proxy stopped, is destroyed. If the port the port destroys the servant, servant is destroyed, the proxy is gone, done. We have still one seven proxy, one servant, and it's also true. Now the last servant proxy goes, it goes to stop one. This servant is destroyed. Let's do it. Okay, done. Oh, oh and the last one goes to the single proxy. I destroy it. This does say, okay. Post the code, stop the thread. The thread stop. And the last one, I join, I join, so thread stop. I'm done. So, at this point, all, is this, all the threads are stopped. This one and the threads are jumped. Okay. No crash at all. Unless you are excited to be a bad amount of threads. So the features of asynchronous, we have the lifetime control, which we just saw, proxies, we have ways to interrupt tasks, we have diagnostics, so when did, how, when did you start, when did you stop, when were you posted, when you, how long did you wait, did you manage or, or, or were you faint? Um, working. And we have a few queues, red pools, and we have task priorities. So it's just a few features. We have also safe callbacks in case you have to interface with some really mean signal coming from anywhere. So let's make a, an, an example. The simplest of all, which would be what the standard is trying to do. So you can wait for the standard to have it. Let's say in 2017, you will have the fix of the STD async. In 2020, you will have the fix of the fix. Because now when you say, when they hear as manager, well, we want to repair the disaster of STD async, so of 2011. But um, we have to do it fast. It's for me a sure sign of we get to do it wrong. So let's say in 2015, we'll have fixed the fix of 2017. Uh, it will be implemented by Clang 2019, probably already, by GCC in 2021, and by Microsoft in 2025. So if you have about 10 more years, could work. Or you could already start using this now. So let's create a scheduler, which means a scheduler proxy, something outside, with a thread pool. It, it's using a log-free queue, because the fastest we should have fun boost with three threads. So now we have, when this is done, we, have, we, have, we are ready. Now we can say, post future, which is the same as this uh, STDS thing. On this schedule, now we say where we want to. So it's an int. So we get a future int. Now we can get, we can, time we can do the same stuff as the standard is doing. Well, okay, it's so about the first 5% of the library. That's right. Okay, they can talk later. They can continue talking. Um, at this time here, the decision of the future, of course, will not block, but the decision of the scheduler blocks until all the tasks are done, which, is a, uh, which I think is a clean shutdown, because in the standard, they say, okay, when this is destroyed, we just give up all the tasks. From what I understood yesterday, we just give up all the tasks, and, well, they're not executed. If my task is a delete, a closed file, a closed connection, it's going to be fun. Well, this one, it will not happen. It's really done. So this is a bit too simple. No post future. Well, okay. Now let's write something fun. A servant. So it's pretty simple servant. It has data and int. And uh, it has two members, do it and fubar. One returns an int, one returns void. And they're doing small stuff, no matter what. So it's a boring class. And we want to offer two members outside. And the constructor, for a bit more fun, is requiring some data. 
So let's write a proxy from the outside world. It has to inherit the type of a second servant proxy, giving the proxy and the servant. And then, when in the constructor, you have to add, 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 give the servant the scheduler. And point, 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 what via dig all what you need in the constructor of the servant. So here we need an int. So we have a constructor taking an int and forwarding it to the servant. And we have two members, one which is witness nothing, it just post a call to Fuba and doing nothing. So we have a macro for this, sorry, it's just macro on this one. And the future equivalent, which gives you a future of the type of the Doit member. So as Doit is an int, we're going to get a future int. When we have this, we can use it. So let's create a single thread scheduler because it's an active object, we don't want it to be, to be thread, to have too many threads. We create the servant proxy on the, in this scheduler. So the servant will be in this scheduler with this as constructor argument. At this point, when this line is done, we created the proxy, we created the servant, and with the good data, we are ready. Now we call the same member as on the, the servant. We have a member foobar and a member do it. Curly proxy foobar is a post, so we're just going to forward the call to the servant. And here, do it, we get a future int. Okay. At this point here, the descriptor is done. The descriptor is done because here we're in the block. And here the scheduler is gone and its thread has been joined, we are finished. So this is interface to outside. Ideally, it will be done just by the main, we should get to wait that you're finished. This will be the other way. Main starts, create the first proxy, and say, okay, I'm, I'm block okay, I run, and wait until you're finished. So the main is the only one you can block. This one you can do, but only, only this one. Now, it happens that the servant is doing stuff which takes time, and you don't want to block the servant too long. Okay, let's make it trackable servant to be, to, to be safe. At the point, we need to give to the, the, the servant the weak scheduler, so he can use it to post. Just do it and don't care about it. And we create here a second argument to the constructor, a, prox a thread pool which we're going to use. Now we create it, we said servant, you will have at your disposal a three thread thread pool, which you can use to do whatever you want. Okay? Now we are ready. Let's start. The servant can call anytime post callback. This is a task which he wants to post in the thread pool. Ideally, it's a thing which is going to be a bit longer than 42, of course. And when the callback, when the task is done, you get to get the callback with an expected containing the value of the exception if one was thrown. thrown. And this will be a callback called. If the servant is destroyed, the so it's perfectly safe to have this in the callback. It's safe, it will be called only if the servant is there, and, and of course, it will not be called from the thread pool, it will be called in the correct thread. No mutex, no lock, no nothing. It will be in the good thread, yours. Okay? So far so good? Hmm? Questions? Is it understandable? Okay, if nobody says anything. What is not good is to have this in the task. As a, here, you should not. In the legal compiler, will check it. That's why I have, well, we have to write a tool for this. Because this will be in the a wrong thread. You have no guarantee that your servant will be alive, and you have probably rest conditions. This you should not do. You should just give, give pa parameters, data, by copy or per move. Never a pointer. Pointers are bad, sharp pointers are not very good, and references are also bad. Move is good, and, and value is good. And post callback returns immediately. So when you call this, <coughs> you continue. It, it's not blocking. It's just sending a task into the thread pool, calling the callback later, and you can continue. And the worker in the restaurant can run to the next stuff because at some point there will be a callback posting this queue and Twenty seconds, ooh, or eighty. 
and well, and, or sometimes your system is draining. Drawing. You have maybe 20 cores, and it's not enough. You don't manage to be on time, and your system is really. So you say, okay, something has happened. I don't want to know it anymore. For example, you get shut down. You don't care. Of course, it requires support from the task itself because there is no good way to stop hard thread. So how do we do it? Instead of calling post callback, we call interruptible post callback with a task. For example, here I make a slip in this task because it's one of the predefined boost thread interruption points. So it can be really interrupted. And I have a callback. And as soon as I'm finished in this example, I call interrupt immediately to stop the task, which means the task may or may not run. And this stuff, the callback, may or may not be called. You, if it's executed, if the task is executed, it will be interrupted. If it has not started yet because it's in the queue, then it will not be executed at all. Which means that the callback will also not come. Okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Oh, like, mm? From the first view, I don't like that the callback is never called. Oh, yes, oh, yes. It's, it's a point of view. We could also, we could also maybe make it call with the value of an exception that it's, it's, it has been interrupted. Theoretically, it's possible. It was just simple, simple like this, simple like this, but well. This, this is not hard. It could be, it could be changed. That is, I didn't send it to the review yet. So theoretically, I still can do whatever I want. So it's discussable. I could make it configurable like this or like this. Logging. So why do we need to log? Because we developers are known. Oh yes, I have to be fast. We are known to be very bad at guessing where we're, where, what, where we are spending much time. We say this function is very, very fast. No, it's not. This or this is going to be less long. No, it doesn't. Okay. So to find bottlenecks, you need to know how long the task really lasts. Lasted. We want to find inefficiency in task, and we want to find concurrency opportunities. What can we start earlier? Because this, oh, it takes longer than I thought. I have no time to parallelize now, but I can just throw other tasks in the straight pool at the same time and gain time. It's easy parallelization. And if you have a state machine, you can, uh, for example, say, I'm going to start five times, defer all the events until I can really handle them and do something else in the, in the, in the way. So it helps you find your bottleneck. It will tell you which task is lasting long enough to be worth parallelizing. And it will tell you, if you're a state machine, how long you spend in the state, which is all you need to diagnostic everything. You will know all what's happening in the system. Whereas you need quite often to find, oh, here we have a problem. Okay, parallelize. Here, no, it's okay. So an example, we take another job this time. It's any logable from a clock. Okay. We take the chrono in this case. So we have seven. This time we're telling that it, the, the thread, its, it's scheduler and the thread pool both use a logable job. And now we call post callback. We give a job name. So which means this task and the callback will be logged at, as int async work. And we have a new macro from two, from future and post, which log, which will give the name. And the call to foo will be also logged in, this, in the single thread scheduler with this name. Then, when you've done this at some point, any time, you can call the get diagnostics on the scheduler proxy, and it will tell you the time it was, a task was, a, a, any task was posted, started, finished, interrupted, and failed. So you know how long it took, how long it waited, and if it managed, or if it was stopped. Asynchronous has a small range of schedulers. You saw the single thread scheduler for, for single thread servants. We have an Azure scheduler. It's very practical if you want to do some TCP communication at the same time. So I just told the scheduler of Azure, pack, uh, pack the IO service inside, and let this I, I'm get done. We have a thread pool scheduler with zero to n threads. You are curious, why can we need a scheduler with zero thread? You will see. I have also multi queue. It's, it has to be at least one thread, and every thread has a one queue. So it reduces um, uh, concurrency on the queue and as it's a bit faster. And you have two versions, stealing versions, which are used in the composite to steal. So what is a composite? Let's say I create two, two schedulers, a multi queue and a stealing. This one is stolen from but doesn't steal. This one steals from. 
This one is one set and three threads, and I create a composite saying now I have just one scheduler made of both schedulers. And they steal from each other. And this is my thread pool. Which means now I can do post callback with my task, my callback, okay, any name, and this is the prio of the thread pool. Zero, it's one based, small trick. Zero means any pool, I don't care. One is the first thread pool, two is the second thread pool, three will be modulo to one. You can also, in the A lot of plus. I thought it was good. 
vai fazer isso. Ele vai se despedir pra, é pra Alice Bros. Você também. So how do you use it? Now well, Lacroix like is now servant. We have to scroll back. And we return the first conservation. This is the first thing we should ask. And get the callback when we are finished. That's it. If you want, interestingly, this also means you have now a way to test algorithms with post threads. If you insert post callback, you would have a unit test. You could just call post future with the same level code. And you could use blocking, so you don't have to create a servant. You can just test your algorithm with the post future, which is practical. I'm not sure I use it very much. Okay, so that's a good. So we have also future conservations in case your, your shell is a bit deprecated, but in case you have just futures which you get from another library, it's practical. Uh, if you give, if you make, for example, some post futures, we have, I have some example. my scheduler, so my, to my thread with more tasks, so sub-tasks, I'm going to get each time, with the post feature, to create a new feature. Then I can say, create a continuation with my three features, or with a vector of future, and when all features are ready, so exceptions are, have a value, the callback will be called, and I can say, okay, I'm done. So if you are forced to do some async, Stuff, whatever which if you just features, you can pack them in continuation and be done with them. But post switch features means calling as a snap by list. So now, um, well, we already have out of uh, dual Xeon uh, twice 10 cores, and unfortunately, it's still not fast enough. We need to buy bigger, bigger, bigger Xeon. Well, which is quite good for Intel, I think. It's quite good from Intel because you can say, oh, uh, a core E7 goes for $100 per core and the Xeon for $250. So it's quite good if we have to switch from E7 to a Xeon. Well, let's say we want to keep our i7 and want to buy, have another PC because next week it's going to be faster. So we need tasks to be sizable because we're going to be remote. Uh, let's define my boost sizeization because I'm just allowed to use boost, so I'm going to use the sizeization in memory. And the written value has to be, or the exception has also to be serializable. Exceptions are not going to be threat. Now let's have a new scheduler. So we create a TCP server scheduler this time based on Boost Azure. And say, okay, my job is a my job. I'm going to listen on server, on this, on my local host, on this port. And I don't need to serialize my task. I give it a new thread code as blockers because I also want to parallelize the serialization of tasks. This stuff is ready to steal some work. Oh, yeah. We can create a composite loop, like always, we create our composite. We have our server pool, and we have our own worker pool where we're going to start doing ourselves a part of our feeble machine, for example. And when a client connects to the server pool to say, hey, do you have something for me? Well, let's see. I try to steal from him, and if I manage, you get it. Then we just need to save those pools in my, my current thread pool, and I'm done. Also, the worker pool is in my thread pool, and I'm ready. So my server pool is as before, and worker pool is any thread pool for my own work. Now I have my server. It, it calculates itself, and it can be stolen from. We just need a client. So we have also a simple TCP server proxy, which is really the simplest one. It gets the address of the server, which is 2C4, a port, something to execute to deserialize the jobs and make use of it. And in this case, how often is we to connect to the server to see there's something to steal? There are more complicated variants also. With, uh, if I have less than five jobs, then I'm going to try to steal. So my current scheduler is an Atom scheduler of communication. If you want to have a second one, it is threaded. Uh, the address port. Now let's make it more. We have a server and several clients who steal from it and help him do the work. And we want a bit more. Let's say we want our client to be not just client, but also server. So, 
prod doit être aussi à create la call request a composite pool. On le met chaque pool, donc the, the pool on which I pack the stuff which I stole from the first server, and a new, the old, and a TCP server like the one I just had, in which I pack the system in the composite together. And now, I have my client stealing from the first server, putting it in the loop, in the one, and the server stealing from this one if some another client connects to it. Which allows us to do something like this. We have a fast um, our main application, so our you know our worker in the restaurant, we're still back to the worker in the restaurant. It's doing very fast, because this time it's really getting a lot of help. Uh, it has two client machines. This one is a simple client, just taking some work to it together. And here it's a client and server, so it's two on it, it starts executing. And here I have another client, let's say uh, some cell phone stealing from the first one and doing in case this one is already full by with what he has. So we start our Fibonacci, the first one, we start making our tree, comes the first client, steals part of the tree, <laughs> stabbing his own tree, comes the next client, comes steal from the first client, and builds also his tree, and so everybody is being his trees, and when are, the last one is the bottom, it goes very fast backward. And the rest team is also working. Okay? So far so good, I just have five minutes, so I try to go fast. Yes. Wait a minute. For the moment, the, sorry, the question is how the client is communicating with the server. Implementing is at the moment just with Azure TCP IP, but it's pretty simple to implement something else. This is your own protocol, you can decide it. We have a question. Uh, simply raise your hand and I'm coming with, uh, with the microphone. Okay? Sorry. Just it. If someone has a question, he uh, should raise his hand and I come with a microphone. So we can record uh, the question to him. Okay. One more question? Okay. So we have a small range of algorithms. Most of them are written by this guy here on the side. Tobias um, is 15 now, right? 16. And uh, he started C one half year ago, and uh, he's already writing some parallel algorithms, so it's possible. He wrote, what did he write? Reduce, find all, extremum, count. If you want to contribute, please, I'm happy to get more because, you know, I'm not expert of paragraphs. I know a few ones which I implemented here, which is about all I know, so for more, please help. Um, all these algorithms are continuation-based, so they inhibit a continuation, I guess we can get like that. They are, of course, non-blocking. They are all distributable because they are all, all the jobs which are being themselves are serializable, so if your job is serializable, it will work. And they are combinable with each other because they are continuation. They work with iterators, with ranges, and with continuations. This is a, an example. We have our normal post callback. So here we do something bad. We have this task. It's just to show this now it's possible. So here we have a parallel form on which we have our own data storage system with some, uh, some member of the class. So from begin to end of our input vector, we want to postcast it because we are doing something mean and add to, uh, to every element of the, uh, of the vector. And this is our cutoff. So if the vector is smaller than 1,500, do it serially, otherwise continue building some task trees. When it's done, so don't forget the return, otherwise you have a void lambda, it won't avoid lambda, it has something telling you this is a continuation, it's going to have a value later, asynchronous fashion, understand this, say, oh, okay. Then you're going to get an expected void, but telling you, I will call you when you really feel you want the whole algorithm is fully stuff. And as you give the, the user the iterator version, you get the void back. I mean, so you don't get anything back. You just get tell you it's done or it's not done. Exception not done. Okay, so you pose this to extract view, you build your tree, and uh, serialize if you want, and when it's done, you get your result. In this version, the caller must ensure that iterators are valid until the callback. It's not very nice. We want something better. So in this case, we have to use C14. Yes, much better. 
with it in this case at two and is it, and then return you back the modified vector that's why now you get an expected of vector from vector int okay when well, the callback is called or every element of your vector has plus two okay let's make it worse we want to combine them so now we, we have something parallel we want to make a parallel pipeline we make post our normal post callback, we move our data like always. To a parallel sort, which after the four is going to sort parallel, of course. So, first, the inside part of the pipeline, which is the first one executed, we'll run this in parallel. When it's done, we'll go move to parallel sort, we'll go do all in parallel. You can put another four behind if you want, or whatever you want, or reduce. And when all the par parallel algorithms in are done, your whole pipeline is finished, you get your callback with your vector int, which has been added to and sorted. Our record at the moment is eight stage pipelines. So it's quite fun. And the dual zone is quite fun. Okay? So we have a small example, if, uh, if I have one more minute. Uh, there was an example of uh, in the Intel documentation of how to write a parallel P, which I shamelessly stole to do it also. I mean, I didn't do it, Tobias did it. Thank you, Tobias. And this is the formula to give us a quarter of P. We need to multiply by four when we are done. So what do we do? We have an operator which is going to calculate the inside part of the formula. Of the formula. We have post callback, and then we say, apply, reduce the sum on the range, so we don't create a real range, we just evaluate it in the next step, from zero to count, so, so the number of iterations of P, this stuff, and the reduce means add. This is, a, we have a sum here, so this is a parallel reduce. Here. When we are done, so this we did parallel, of course, we still need to multiply by four. So we invoke as a result something which makes times four. When this is done and both are done, we get our double because we reduce the power of the and what? So asynchronous is to be found in GitHub. And when, when it's after the review, it's done, You said before that uh, in the body of the task we should not pass this pointer or whatever yes. uh, unless we ensure object left time. Yes. Uh, does uh, you think that could be some problem using those if my class a sense from enable shared from this, I can use shared from this, or there are some kind of problems in that. So the question is, if I can use this as an iterator version, if I'm using some shared from this or some mechanism? Yes, of course. Uh, if you want to take yourself the risk, and you know what you're doing, there is a version for this. And which could be the risk? I personally prefer to move the data back to a synchronous, say, do what you want, I want to have it back. But well, no risk, no fun, if you really want. Okay, Please. thanks. Without blocking, in what context or at what point will the callbacks of your um, post callback be called? Like um, in, the cute co or in the cute world, eventually the event loop will run and then call something. But if you don't have cute, when will the callback be ever called? I don't have to, okay, so the question is, when the, what, what, when the callback will be called? So the callback, so first we execute a task, any task, and the callback is pushed to the queue of the scheduler of the, where the servant is living, and the scheduler takes it and checks if the servant is still alive. If the servant is alive, the callback is called. If it's not alive, it's just thrown away. No, I misunderstood the question. No, I think... Um, 
assume after the post call back, I go into a busy loop, like um, while true do something. Oh no. Yeah, well, but I mean, um, uh, sure, no, I won't do no, that. But no, assume no. assume I do something else computationally intensive. Uh, when will the callback be called? Like, do I have okay. to call dot .get on the scheduler or something to block and actually tell him to check for uh, okay. done jobs? Obviously, if I do some busy wait after the post callback, I'm going to be busy. I have a, a single thread scheduler. Um, nothing will happen. The queue will grow until I'm done. And then when I'm done, I will start dequeuing my, emptying my task queue. And at some point, the callback will be inside and then it will be called. It can be long. You should not do this. You should not do anything long in the in this single source scheduler. When you're doing this, you're wasting chance of parallelization, chance of concurrency, and you're just being a mix slow. You can do, but you should not. Everything which is taking too long, throw it to the thread pool. 